From September to September 1918 to 19, she served as a draftsman for the construction division of the Quartermaster Corps of the War Department at Fort McPherson in East Point. Um, her starting salary was uh, $1,200 a year. And it's interesting because I was able to secure all her civilian war records back in the 90s. And um, I, because she served in World War II as well. A lot of architects did that. Basically, domestic building dries up when you have a big war. And uh, her records show that prior to 1918, she had been thriving. She had employed four draftsmen, it says, including Frank Mack, who had also been appointed as a draftsman at Fort McPherson in the same month as Wilburn. Of the 11 appointees on September 20th, Wilburn was the only woman. So then we were back to the 1920s when she comes back to work. And in the 1920s, um, excuse me, I just need to make sure I get all this in. Okay, this was in the, in, uh, she advertised her, her second plan book, which is Brick and Colonial Homes. There it is there, special ex exhibition offer. You could, you could come by her booth and sign in. And uh, if you were the lucky winner, you'd get a free set of plans for one of the, one of the plans in the book. Smart, really smart. And then, I think I can read this from here because she was really well known in the 20s. She was known as, uh, you can't read it here, but it says, both designs that she was offering here, two types of bungle, two types of southern homes, you know, you have the colonial two-story, and then you have the bungalow here. And these are from the plan book. And then there's the advertisement for the plan book there. And then at the very end of this article here, which is showing, it says, both designs, this one and this one, by Leela Ross Wilburn, Atlanta's well-known woman architect. So back in, in that day, she was, she was thriving. She was doing well. And here's another, another notation of that. Women, Atlanta women have man-sized jobs. And the, the, whoops, sorry. Sorry. This is Wilburn right here. These other women were profiled. She was the only architect. And as you can see, she's busy drafting, even though she was having her picture taken for the press. I don't know how the woman did all this. I really don't, but the 1920s was a building boom. It was the Roaring Twenties, so she was roaring with it. And um, even, even after, you know, the Depression, uh, the stock market fell in 1929, even in the uh, 1930s, she was putting out plan books. And this is... This is on, on Johnson Road, actually. There are lots of houses in Morningside, in Johnson Road. And I noted here, um, Johnson Road built in 1932, Atlanta History Center, uh, and this is the name of the people, and it's the plan number, and they have nine sheets of that drawing. So it's really worthwhile to go over there and check those things out. Atlanta was on a big, big roll. All the neighborhoods were being built out. I'll just mention some. The north side of the city, 
Well, Ansley Park had annex lots that were being built further toward where the Ansley Park, uh, the Ansley Club is. On the north side of the city, names like Peachtree Heights Park, uh, Buckhead a bit further out, and Brookhaven. And by the mid 1920s, uh, Brookwood Hills, Haynes Manor, Tuxedo Park, Lennox Park, and expanded Virginia Highland, Garden Hills, Peachtree Hills Place, Miramar, Highland Park, Country Club Estates, Collins Park, Highland Park, and Roxborough Park. On the south side, you had Sil Sylvan Hills was opened in 1922, and to the east, George Willis was developing Avondale Estates east of Decatur. So all this is happening in the 20s. Do you have Morningside in there? Yeah, Morningside. That was, yeah, well, that, that is in Morningside and Lennox Park. Yeah, yeah, Johnson Road, yeah. So, okay, getting ahead of myself here. This was New Homes of Quality. This is the one that we don't have the cover for. But, um, so. Back to the war in 1940. In the 1940s, she went back to war again, but this time for three years. She worked in uh, Tampa for, um, at the geodetic survey there, and she was drawing maps and all kinds of stuff. She was a junior engineering draftsman, U.S. Coast and Geodetic Survey of the Department of Congress, Air Photographic Party Number no. 1 in Tampa, Florida. Her civil service rank was SP3, with a starting salary of $1,440 per annum. Uh, she applied to go to Washington, D.C. as a senior drafting engineering draftsman in the uh, Army Services, Service Forces, Office of the Quartermaster, General Storage Distribution Division in Washington, D.C., SP-6. And uh, was making, she started with a year, yearly salary of 2,000 with a final salary of 2,430. And after 1945, she returned to private practice. This this mentions her, this is the uh, Casa Grande, Arizona Casa Grande uh, newspaper, which talks about women doing engineering in the Quartermaster Corps, and she's included in this. This is in 1945, 43 or 45, I can't see. Another member of this group, Miss Lila Ross, Wil Lila Wilburn of Atlanta, Georgia, is a registered architect having almost 35 years of experience in handling private residence, building jobs, and a mail order business. But she was recognized. She returns to Atlanta in 1945, spent two more, three years, two years in, uh, in, in DC, came back to Atlanta, and went back to the Peters Building, and resumed doing plan books and uh, drafting uh, plans for houses. Uh, she was 60 years old when she came back from the war. The country had changed. There was the New Deal um, that had started and helped people get mortgages and uh, finance housing. Um, and that was before the war, but then after the war, it increased, and we had the development of a whole lot of other neighborhoods and a whole lot of other styles, including the ranch. It's interesting. Um, Robert Craig, you know, the wonderful art historian, has said that at Georgia Tech, has said, quote, Wilburn designed houses proliferated throughout neighborhoods and suburbs of Atlanta and elsewhere in Georgia 
where there are more houses by Wilburn than by any other architect from any period. So we take great pride in our hometown girl, you know. But her influence because of the direction she took her practice with these plan books was extraordinary. Here are the other this was the beginning of the beginning of the ranch house and the beginning of split levels. And then here are the here are the last four plan books. Small low cost homes for the South, sixty good new homes, ranch and colonial homes and brand new homes. And then here are a couple of examples. They're both from Brookhaven. And uh, this is called, in her copy, she calls this the Cape Cod Colonial. It's just charming. I don't know if it's still in existence. Um, it's still but there, this, Mom. excuse me? It's still there, Mom. Oh, oh, Howard, okay, good. <laughs> Thanks. Howard lives in Brookhaven. <laughs> He's the expert there. So um, it's, it's just a charming, a charming place. And then here's what was called, a it's a ranch, but it's a, with a French, colon uh, French provincial kind of add-ons, you know. So, and there it is, up there in brand new homes which is the final plan book. And then, again, we're getting toward the end of her career here. We're going to go... We're going to go to Claremont Heights. You know where that is, I think, probably. Okay, lots of split levels, beautiful buildings. Um, Rolling Hills. There it is. Leela Ross Wilburn, registered architect number 29, one Peachtree building. The Peters building had been torn down. Residence for Mr. Harold Holder, Decatur, Georgia. She was an incredible draftsman. Drafts woman, yeah. And here's here's a, here's a lovely ranch in um, Amber Glades, which is north, the northern part of the city. So sorry. And then I just want to end with a couple of things. Um, this is not in the plan book, but I'm going to be speaking at the, um, in Forsyth, Georgia in May at the Monroe County uh, Historical Society because back in the 90s, I found out through all the research I did on, on her drawings that there were a whole lot of houses in Forsyth and uh, that were in the later books. And I had the names of the people and everything because of these drawings. I, I had clues I could follow. It's like following breadcrumbs. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they have invited me to come back. And so I'm going to try to do a presentation around, around what they have. I'm very excited about that. This was a house that was built for uh, a citizen of Forsyth. She worked in three, three or four different neighborhoods there helping the builders and developers make those uh, neighborhoods come to life, make, make that they were sub suburbs, subdivisions. But this, I was told, and I can't validate this, I will have to validate when I get there, was for a person who wanted a house built on St. Simons. And I just want to... I want to read you about it because it's a, a remarkable plan, and I'm assuming it's a a um, custom design 
Um, but it demonstrates her interest in and ability to adopt the modern ranch in some of the more radical forms and up-to-date materials, which are the solid brick wall across the front of the house, orienting family activities to the privacy of the backyard, plate glass clear story um, windows, low salon Eckler style roof, letting in light, a unique iron gated entry there, and partial masonite board and batten siding on the front. Um, and covering the rear elevation. Other features include Curtis awning windows. All this is designated in these drawings. And glide windows, a triple pass door off the family room overlooking the garden, a floodlight on the patio, and tube lighting under the kitchen cabinets. I just think it's remarkable that this is for uh, Mr. and Mrs. William Sullins in Forsyth. And then another person that I met when I was in, in um, Forsyth was uh, Rosalind Harbuck. And she and her husband, this was in the 50s, yeah, late 50s, were building, they were going to build a nursing home. And so they, because the Harbuck, Mrs. Harbuck's family had lived in a Wilburn-designed house. It was very much like a house in Morningside with the slope Tudor thing. She called her, because she was an older woman at that time, and she said, would you make a proposal for a nursing home that we want to put up? Because there was a lot of money coming from the federal government back then for people to have nursing homes that were in rural settings, you know, back in the day. So this is, this is what she came up with. This, this is called the Hilltop Nursing Home Plan. But I just wanted to show you that even at the end of her life, she was designing housing, multiple housing, for people that were at the end of their life. Um, the Harbucks chose, uh, chose another architect who had done a lot more nursing homes and things. But it's, it just shows a constant learning curve, constant challenging things, finding out things. All those little dots represent plans when I interfaced private collections and of drawings and the drawings that are at the Atlanta History Center and the books and all the other information that I had about Wilburn. I put it all together and I found that um, there are over 50, these are the cities down here, you can't really see them very well, but these are the cities in the states from Georgia, uh, South Carolina, North Carolina, Mississippi, Florida, and Alabama, where I can document the, the plans that were drawn. Um, so you've got 50 cities and towns in Georgia, 23 cities in North Carolina, five in South Carolina, three cities in Alabama, one city in Mississippi, two in Florida, and one in Oklahoma. Um, other documents that we have mention houses in Texas and Oklahoma. Oh, excuse me, in Texas. So, what you have here is a scope that is even beyond what Robert Craig said. That the way she designed her practice made it possible for people all over the South to have access to these plans. So, um, She's buried in the Decatur Cemetery along with the whole Wilburn clan, right next to her sister who died later 
and her youngest sister, Llewellyn, and then her um, and her mother and father. And I'll end with with her signature again from the war records, but and and also a quote from her when she was interviewed in one of these for one of the newspaper articles. There is nothing I like better, and I don't believe I'd be satisfied with any other job in the world. Leo Ross Wilburn.